It is the mid-1800s. Sam Cabell, a wealthy landowner from Georgia, packs up all he owns and sets out to the Appalachian Mountains. Cabell recently purchased land in what is now Institute West Virginia in hopes to build a plantation and make a great profit for the salt mines in the region. It was common in this era that a white, wealthy landowner from the South would own slaves. We know that he traveled to Virginia, purchased Mary Barnes and other slaves. And Mary, from what I understand in my reading, was a very fair woman, a rather attractive woman from what I can gather. Uh, even in a book written by Dorothy Withrow, From the Grove to the Stars, she only states that Mary and her children were deemed free in his will. A lot of prominent Virginians moved into the Kanawha Valley with their slaves or bought slaves when they were here. A lot of them, like Sam Cabell, um, obtained large pieces of riverfront property and basically built slave plantations on that property. I've been at the Gazette 60 years now and in all those years the very most favorite story I ever wrote was about the origin of Institute and the origin of what is now State University. It just was a profoundly human story revealing an awful lot about people and it really did grab me when I was in my 30s and first found all this. One day I was in the courthouse records room digging for some sort of scoop and a lawyer came to me and said he wanted to show me a scandal in one of the old prominent white families of the valley and he took me back to the ancient handwritten wills and he got out a copy of Samuel Cabell's wills. This area in the Kanawha Valley specifically before the Civil War, the area actually had grown into a, a, a very important industrial region, especially around Malden and the upper end of what today is, is Charleston. There was a very large salt industry there. Uh, salt wells were drilled and furnaces were, were built to boil brine down, which is how the salt occurs in this area. Um, to be used for processing meat and preserving meat. And so that, that brought a lot of people here into this area. Most people were farmers before the Civil War here. The vast majority of residents in this area and in Appalachia farmed. Uh, some farmers were slave owners. And in this area, slavery, interestingly, was more prevalent than it was in any areas in Western Virginia, mainly due to the salt industry. And in, in fact, Kanawha County in the 1830s to 1850s had the highest percentage of African American slaves of any v Virginia county west of the Allegheny Mountains. After a long trip, Samuel Cabell finally makes his way into Charleston. He's greeted by friendly faces and warm hellos. A smile comes across Sam's face as he sees the lawyer's office. He stalls his horse, and as he walks inside, he's greeted by the lawyer, in which he has only corresponded through letters. Can I help you, sir? Yes, I am Samuel Cabell. I am here to meet with Mr. Stone about a deed to my land. Oh, Mr. Cabell, I am Mr. Stone. It's good to finally put a face to all those letters we've been receiving. I got your deed all written up, sir. Let's get your signatures, and we can get you down to your new property. James! Yes, sir? Go on and get some whiskey for Mr. Cabell. He's got some celebrating ahead of him. Sign here, here, and here. Well, thank you, sir. Gentlemen, your whiskey. Thank you, James. Yeah, that's a good boy there. Mm. That's some fine whiskey, too. Sure is, sir. Thank you for the drink. So here's the size of my property? Yes, sir. Over 900 acres of good farming land and salt mines. You got big plans for this land, I take it. One more signature here, sir. Very good, sir. Let me be the first to officially welcome you to the Great Canal Valley. Is there anything else you need before we send you on your way, sir? As a matter of fact, while I'm here, do you gentlemen also prepare wills? We sure do. If you want to get all your documentation together, we can get that done for you. Well, sir, we need to figure out who you want to leave all your acquired land and assets to. It will be left to my w wife, Mary Barnes. Well, sir, I'll have all the proper documentation in a few days. Will it be all right if I bring it to you? That will be fine, sir. 
What was most uncommon about Sam Cavill is that he had fallen in love with a young African-American woman by the name of Mary Barnes, which he had wed. This marriage led to 15 children from Sam and Mary that all went on to get great educations. Their children were raised and treated as free people. For this, Sam was harassed for being in love with an African-American woman. In this time, it was considered unacceptable to treat African-Americans as equals. Therefore, this forged a turmoil in a war-stricken region that eventually led to the death of Sam Cavill. I think I did track down the deed where he bought the land from Martha Washington heirs. Somehow, some record made me think he had used the slaves in the salt works before he came on down to Institute. In that era, land was all the only wealth, really, that you could buy and hold and use. Agriculture was pretty much the bedrock of the economy. I think the year was 1858 that he actually decided to go to the county courthouse uh, and he decided to um, uh, edit his will or to add a codicil to his will stating that Mary and her children have always been free. All the purchases of slaves in Virginia, which I thought was kind of interesting, but that they had always been free and any lands or properties that he had all of it would go to her and to her children. Most people would come into the area um, seeking work for a lot of reasons. For, you know, in many cases, folks came to work in the salt industry. Um, African Americans wound up here because they had no choice. They were enslaved and were slaves working in salt making. Charleston at the time was a very, very small village, a population of about a thousand. The outlying area, including Institute, was all agricultural, just farmland. Most people were farmers. There was not, outside the uh, salt industry, there was not much else in terms of industry or really an attraction. The area remained relatively small in population until Charleston became the state capital. And that occurred in 1870, and then the capital moved back to Wheeling in 1875 and then came back here permanently in 1885. And that's when the area really began to grow. And a lot of folks moved in to Charleston for opportunities then. The original campus actually faced the river. Now we think that everybody always comes in from the interstate side or off Route 25. But originally, if you look at old maps or old photographs, most of the buildings were built on the, the south end of the campus facing the river or near the river or the railroad, which is how everyone got here originally. And then over time, as the automobile became more popular, the campus shifted farther north, more and more land was needed, and it expanded, and then we kind of turned the other way, now facing out toward the front, or the interstate. Knowing that he has misspoken, Samuel Cabell leaves the lawyer's office aware of the consequences of having a relationship with a slave. This was illegal and frowned upon in the southern communities. Nevertheless, Samuel's love for Mary went against the social norms of the South. This became one of the pivotal moments in history that changed the course of Samuel and Mary's future. Whoa, Billy! Really? Good evening, Mr. Stone. How do you do, sir? Very good, sir. I have those documents for you. We were about to have dinner. Would you like to join us? I don't want to impose. Not at all, sir. Come join us. Come in, sir. Mary, take Mr. Stone's hat and cane. Your hat, sir. Thank you, girl. Mr. Cavill, I don't want to intrude on your nice dinner. Nonsense, sir. You're a guest in my home. Mary, get another setting for Mr. Stone. You have a beautiful home here, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Stone. Will I be meeting Mrs. Cavill? Yes. She will be dining with us shortly. Well, sir, down to business. I need to... Thank you, Mary. Thank you, girl. Sir, your slave girl is eating at your fine dinner table. Why is she here? <laughs> Mr. Stone, may I introduce to you my wife, Mary Bonds? My word, sir. This is not acceptable. We here in our community do not have any relations with our slaves. With all due respect, sir, she is my wife whom I love dearly. Nothing in the world can change that, not even your damn Southern society. Now please leave my home and process my documentation. I will do my position, sir, but know this. After, I will no longer be your lawyer, for this is an abomination to God and decent Southern white people in our community. 
I would imagine that Sam Cavill was regarded as being an outcast um, for the very fact that he not only fell in love with an African American who had been his slave, but then he also turned around and, and gave her legally um, his property, which would have been a very progressive way of thinking in those days. And I, I, I would imagine, um, knowing the history of, of Cabell and what ended up happening to him, that um, there were a lot of people who did not agree or approve of him doing it, and consequently it would, it would cost him his life. It was a crime to marry a black person. In fact, it remained a crime way up till the 1950s or so, when there was a couple named Loving. A white man and a black woman got married, I think in Virginia, and the cops came and arrested them, and they had fought it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court threw out the old miscegenation laws, which forbid intermarriage. I guess the white neighbors just assumed he was an old bachelor, but actually he fell totally in love with one of his slave women, Mary Barnes, and he took her as his lifelong mate, and he had 13 children by her, and in those days a lot of slave owners would use their black women just first one then another then another as concubines. Cabell apparently just fell completely for Mary Barnes and stayed with her and had children only with her. Although many slave owners at this time were guilty of having relations with their female slaves it was unheard of for a man to try to marry one of his slaves. It was clear that no amount of opposition was going to stop Sam Cabell from being with Mary. Sam had chosen her as the mother of his children and his lifelong companion. Nothing was going to change that. Sam and Mary had a love that was both pure and unconditional. You've chosen a nice slice of heaven here, Sam. You've couldn't have bought a prettier place on earth. Mary, I have the prettiest thing on earth, and that is you. Mary, are you happy here? Yes, Sam. Why do you ask me this? Are you not happy here? Yes. I am the happiest when I'm here with you, my love. But the people here will not accept the notion that I truly love you. They might not be so forgiving, and if anything happens to you or the children, I'll... What about the children? We have great dreams for them and their future. If you leave us, what will happen to them? Or me? Will they come for us? My love, do not worry about such things. I have taken care of you, have I not? and the children will have an education like any other child, white or Negro. You and the children deserve a good life. They will not survive here, Sam. They will not get the proper education you won't Then forget. send them north to the free states. They will have a better chance as free people there. You have everything worked out for us. That's why I love you, Samuel Cabell. During the Civil War, the Kanawha Valley was, um, was pretty hotly contested. It was one of the areas that um, had some of the very earliest fighting in the Civil War in 1861. Union troops first arrived from Ohio in July of 1861, and they actually engaged the Confederates in a battle at Scary Creek, which is not too far from our campus. The end result of that battle was that the Confederates won, and the Northern troops eventually recaptured the Kanawha Valley, and the Confederates were forced out by the end of 1861, which allowed the statehood process that was going on in Wheeling to continue because by the end of that first year of fighting in the winter of 1861 and 62, most of present-day West Virginia was occupied by Union troops. We would have to speculate that perhaps they did, and if she was his common-law wife and they had more than one child, it, was, it, it, would, it would not have been a surprise if a slave master had fathered one or two children, they all still remained in the slave quarters, and there was never any other connection. In other words, the slave woman never moved into the house after the wife's death or anything like that. So we don't have that. So the only thing that we can speculate is that they lived as free people. I did record that they actually were educated. They were sent to some academies over in Ohio, or at least part of them were, and that was rare for blacks in the, at that time. Even to be able to learn to read and write was a big major breakthrough. After the Civil War, blacks were still pretty much hated outcasts. West Virginia didn't really want them 
this little refuge down here at Institute became a sanctuary where blacks could come work, make homes, and, and it became a safety spot. If they weren't wanted out in the white towns and the white countryside, but they were always safe down here at Institute. It naturally became a kind of a magnet, drawing black ex-slaves, people who had been freed from slavery wound up here. In West Virginia, even though we were established as a northern state, per se, we still had slavery until the end of the Civil War, and we were a segregated state. It's very difficult for my students and, and students in public schools to understand that you know, the prevailing attitude is, oh, West Virginia was this great northern bastion of freedom, and, which is not really true at all. It was far more complicated than that. We, in order to become a state, actually, we had to come up with a formula to liberate or emancipate the slaves in West Virginia, which we would do. But at the end of the Civil War, there was still a lot of animosity uh, among a lot of whites, and especially this area, which had a lot of southern-minded people in it. A lot of the white folks here in the Kanawha Valley could trace their lineage to old Virginia. They had migrated over the mountains, or their ancestors had, to settle this area. Many of them brought their slaves, as I mentioned, with them. So um, it was a, a long stretch for them to think about equality. At this point, everything seemed perfect for Sam and Mary. Little did they know, both of their worlds were about to be turned upside down. The people of the Great Kanawha community were not happy about Sam and Mary's relationship, and their anger was about to reveal itself. Hello, good fellow. Poor now. I make that double. Hello, Mr. Stone. What troubles you? It's, uh, nothing. Why so grim? You need to drink up and talk about what ails you. Well, I met with Mr. Cabell night before last. Mr. Cabell, you say? How is the man getting along with that big piece of land? Decent, I presume. However, that is not what ails me. What ails me is that he has defiled a decent southern white man's name. What do you mean? He is having relations with his slave girl. <laughs> That's nothing new. No. He is having relations with her and has a common law marriage with her. Well, I'll be damned. What kind of decent white man would go do such a thing? Fellas, come hear this. Tell him, Mr. Stone. I do not want to further any more gossip. No, no. Tell them what you just spoke. Well, I'll tell them. He got worried that his white neighbors might do something to him, so he started writing wills to give this big, wide valley plantation to his slave woman and her 13 children. He wrote a will. He didn't file them in the courthouse. I guess he hid them in his house. Then later he would write another one as more children were born, and he worried about his, his demise, he kept saying. Um, several men came to his home. Uh, somehow there was some altercation and Sam Cabell was killed. There is some historical debate over the events that led up to the death of Sam Cabell, but regardless of what actually happened, the damage was done. Mary was heartbroken after the death of her true love, Sam. Her life would never be the same after this day, but she refused to let Sam's death be in vain. The seven conspirators that confronted Cabell that day were eventually tried for his murder. So the newspaper accounts didn't give exact facts the way newspapers do today. They more were arguing over who was a, a true patriotic American and who was a, a rebel a traitor. So somehow an accusation had sprung up that these white neighbors were in the Union League and had killed him because he was a Confederate sympathizer. Come out here. Cabell, I know you hear me. Come out now. Cabell, come out now or we'll come in after you. No one will be safe. Mary, Mary, get the children and hide in the cellar now. No, Sam. What about you, my love? I will be all right. You just hide. I love you. Now go. Papa, come with us. No, Elizabeth. Papa will be fine. Be brave and go with your mother and the others. Papa. Go, girl. You are giving us no choice, Sam Cabell. We're coming in. 
Why are you men here? You know why we are here. I'm deeply sorry, Sam. I am. But this is not a way to live. I did not mean for this to happen. I'm truly sorry. Shut up, Mr. Stone. You've done your part. Now leave from here and don't look back. You have no business here. Y'all need to go now. Sam, where's your slave girl? We know all about you and her. That is not the true nature of your coming here, sir. State your business and soon leave my family. They don't need to be a part of this. Sam, we're not here for a disagreement. We just want to have a friendly conversation with you. We'll speak your peace, sirs, and then leave us be. We have no want for quarrel. Sam! Why did you do this? Why, Sam! We did not mean for this to happen. Let's leave her be. Go! Go! With the, the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th, through 15th Amendments to the Constitution, we begin down the long road toward equality. The courtroom was shocked after the defense attorney delivered the plea of not guilty. It was obvious to everyone in the community that at least one of these seven men killed Sam Cavill, if not all seven together. Surely the judge would not let Sam's killers go unpunished. Order. Order in the court. How do you plead? Your Honor. My clients plead not guilty. Order! 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 Order in the court. Well, since we found no evidence at the scene of the crime, and there were no witnesses, we, the court of Western Virginia, find the defendants not guilty. This case has been dismissed. They are free to go. Congress, in, uh, had, in 1865, passed what was considered the first moral, and as I said, sometimes some people pronounce it Moral Act uh, in 1865. That act specified that uh, each state would have to establish certain agricultural and industrial schools uh, or colleges, is what I'm saying. And I think the first one for West Virginia was what we know today as WVU. Um, and then another act was passed in 1890 and as a result of that um, that act specified that states had to provide such a school an agricultural school for uh, Negro uh, students and um, that was what started the ball rolling for West Virginia State. Mary Barnes dug out all these handwritten wills and took them to the courthouse. Believe it or not, they stood up legally. The court commissioners uh, decreed that she and the children would inherit this whole valley down here. And so that's how West Virginia's very largest black community came to exist. In either case, the men pleaded not guilty by way of self-defense, uh, and they were acquitted. Uh, but. The speculation has been, there's been a couple of things. One is that these men wanted the land that he was on, did not, and that perhaps they did not know that he had already changed his will so that that property would transfer to Mary Barnes. Education was key to equality. And there was one big problem. Very few African Americans had the opportunity to go to school either couldn't afford it or there, there just simply were no opportunities. West Virginia was, was fairly progressive because there was a school for African Americans, but it was in Harpers Ferry. It was called Storer College up on the hill um, outside of downtown Harpers Ferry. And in 1890, with that in mind that African Americans wanted and needed to be educated, the U.S. Congress passed a second Moral Land Grant Act. That land grant act was a carbon copy of the first land grant, setting up these, these public institutions to educate students, but the difference was that they were set up for African Americans, and they were to be established in states that practice separate education, which West Virginia was one. Originally there were 17 land grants in the United States, and West Virginia State was one of them. Until 1915, the, the institution was called West Virginia Colored Institute, and hence the name Institute. That's where the, the name of the town, and the town itself of Institute originated and grew up around the, the campus. It had been a, um, a plantation, a farm, until the 1890s. In fact, it was called Farm locally, and also known as Piney Grove. 
When um, the campus was built, started with a, a handful of buildings, later expanded, uh, enrollment was in the dozens and then it climbed into the hundreds, eventually reached a thousand I think in the 1920s. In 1915, as a result of uh, new leadership here, the name of the school was changed to the West Virginia Collegiate Institute. And that is the, the watershed date when we started offering more college preparation courses. In 1929, as a result of a study that was done the previous year by the, the Department of Education, we would change our name to West Virginia State College. And we were still an all-black institution because our educational um, system was segregated still. 1929, we became West Virginia um, State College. And in 1954, the watershed Brown versus Board of Education ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court meant that West Virginia State integrated in reverse. And after 1954, um, virtually in the blink of an eye, within 10 years, we went from a, um, an all-black educational institution to a predominantly white commuter school by the early 1960s which is what we, what we really have evolved into now. Immediately we became a great success when it was established. Um, started very small with just a handful of students. To, to really understand and appreciate the history of West Virginia State, um, you, you have to go back to 1862 and the passage of the Morrill Land Grant Act, which was an act um, passed through our Congress that in a nutshell, gave states money, gave them land to sell out west in order to establish agricultural and engineering schools, state land grant schools, colleges. The land grant for West Virginia was obviously West Virginia University, founded in Morgantown, 1867. Every state in the Union um, had the opportunity to establish and did, in fact, establish these land grant schools. Even with several witnesses and Sam's body found at his house, no one was ever charged with his murder. Technology had not yet advanced far enough to gather substantial evidence from the crime scene, and it was not uncommon for a group of white males to be acquitted for a crime of this nature at that time. Later on, Mary Barnes petitioned to the courts to accept one of Sam's wills leaving her the rights to his plantation property. This is how there came to be a university of higher education on these very grounds today. Way over by the rehab center, there's a little tiny graveyard, and it still has the grave of Samuel Cavill and Mary Barnes there side by side. And I snapped a picture of it, and we wrote this account in the Charleston Gazette in 1970, and it was a very touching article, and it was picked up and reprinted in the State Historical Journal, and then I incorporated it into a book of West Virginia historical episodes called Fascinating West Virginia and it's been reprinted as a little pamphlet here at the State University campus. After 60 years at the newspaper that remains my very favorite story. Where currently the school's tennis courts are today uh, there used to be a grove there of trees. Legend has it that there was a spring there, a bubbling spring of water that just bubbled up. Uh, supposedly this water, this spring had curative powers, but supposedly, okay, and it is probably more legend than anything, more myth uh, than anything. Uh, but that was the, uh, the purpose of the title because it started out as a grove right where the tennis courts are. Now Dolly Withrow sort of said you can just imagine that perhaps Sam and Mary spent a number of hours just sitting out there in that grove. Well, that was um, that was a part of their property, which I thought was kind of a nice little twist to the whole story from the grove to the stars. <laughs>